Jesus Christ Productions. At the beginning of the PS2 era, Tekken Tag Tournament set a high standard for fighting games. My dad, my brother and I played it all the time and to this day it's my most beloved fighting game of all time. By the time we got the PS2 at home, the next entry, Tekken 4, was already out. Developed and published by Namco and released in 2002, it was a pretty common arcade cabinet. This is the only Tekken game that I played briefly in the arcades in Sweden before we got our hands on the console version. I remember gaping in awe of the graphics and seeing King with long hair in a jungle setting. Oh boy did I want this game. My friend Allison, who lives in the US, went to the Next Level Pinball Museum in Hillsboro, Oregon to see if she could find Tekken 4. Sadly, they didn't have it, but at least 2, 3 and Tag Tournament were representing the series. I don't remember exactly when, but it must have been around 2004 that my dad bought the game. At the time we were amazed by its visuals, but felt conflicted about the gameplay itself. Something didn't feel right. We played it for a summer, but eventually scurried back to Tekken Tag, which we considered the superior game. Today, out of all the main Tekken entries, it's the one that's taken me the longest to revisit. According to my memory card, I last touched it in 2010, and that seems about right. But I'm more than ready to pop it in and come back to it with a fresh perspective. How does Tekken 4 hold up 22 years after its release? Join me as I get ready for the next battle. From the gamer who legend, he's come to show you the way in this world of games. G from reviews. Right from the beginning, you notice things are different because the opening cinematic actually has people talking. Not a jaw-dropping upgrade, but it's more than nothing, obviously. It begins with a flashback of Heihachi throwing his son Kazuya into a volcano. A nice, comforting tradition. In Tekken 3 he was believed to be dead, but Heihachi learns that Kazuya still lives. How's that possible? This is accompanied by random clips of some of the new characters. It's an impressive little mosaic, especially for its time and it captures my interest. Sad Sadly, I don't really like the music, which is a shame because 2, 3 and Tag all had amazing songs kicking off the intro. There are 23 characters in this game. That's the same amount as in the third entry, but a lot less than in Tekken Tag, which had 45. Today I don't mind it, but at the time it was a huge letdown. Didn't they know more is always better? That's what I thought at least. Kazuya Mishima, Li Chao Lan and Martial Law make a triumphant return after their absence in Tekken 3. Notably missing is Anna, who's playable in every single main entry except this one and the new 8th entry. But who knows nowadays with the DLC and all that good shit. Also it's the only title without a playable Jack character. At the start you get 10 characters and have to unlock the remaining 13 by either beating the story mode a certain amount of times or with a specific character. Six of them are new, so let's introduce Introduce the newcomers. Steve Fox is a famous British boxer who's on the run from the Mafia. As a young teen I hated playing as him because it was such a style change. As a boxer the kick buttons don't work like they do for every other character and it takes some practice getting familiar with his mostly kickless, top heavy moveset. Today I think he's one of the most fun blokes to play as with his quick jabs. Christy Montiero is the granddaughter of Eddie Gordo's Capoeira Master. At first I thought she replaced Eddie completely, but it turns out that you unlock him later as a sort of palette swap. This fighting style is just a blast to play, but at the age of 13 or 14, I had different things on my mind. I mean, hot damn, this gal was something else. No wonder she's the most played character on our old memory card. Don't judge. Craig Marduk was a professional Vale Tudo fighter until he fucking murdered Armor King. Was that necessary? He's busted out of prison thanks to an anonymous benefactor who turns out to be the vengeful king. He's notable for either having long hair or being bald depending on the costume you choose. I neither like him as a person nor as a fighter so I rarely played as him at the time. That's what you get for being a scumbag. Neglect. Miharu Hirano only appears in main entry number 4. She's pretty much just a color flip for Ling Xiaoyu. Her hitbox is smaller though, which gives her a slight edge. She doesn't even get her own story and just appears in Xiaoyu's ending. Plus she only has one measly costume. Therefore she can't fight against herself. Maybe she's just mentally stable. 
Violet looks an awful lot like Lee. Well, of course I know him. He's me. Lee built up a robotics company under this new disguise, which he used to hide from Heihachi. There's a weird system for unlocking characters in Violet's story. Beating story mode twice unlocks Violet. Beating story mode 8 times or with Violet unlocks Lee. Too bad Lee then becomes the default image on the character select screen. I would have liked it the other way around. As you would expect, they both play exactly the same, so it's basically another spin on the color roulette. Combot is a robot that was built by Violet slash Lee with the purpose of entering the King of Iron Fist Tournament 4. Similar to Mokujin in Tekken 3, it mimics the fighting styles of other characters. The difference between them is that Combot doesn't change his style after each round. I like both approaches. This is the Metal Dude's only playable appearance in the main series, because it was later replaced by the fighter it was copying in this game. The Circle of Artificial Life. From what I gather, Tekken 4 might be the most unpopular game in the main series. But it does in fact stand out from the crowd for several reasons. It doesn't really play like any of the others. First of all, you can move before the match begins. There's downtime to fuss around, dance around or whatever. You can't do that in any other main entry. Also, you can save replays for the first time, which I've never done to be honest. Every game before this had boundless battlefields. Here, obstacles like walls and pillars are introduced to the environment, which you can interact with and use to your advantage. They anchor every stage and this new focus on the surroundings completely changes the way you tackle these fights. You don't want to be backend against a wall. It also has varying elevation on some floors. That's not all. The sidestep takes a backseat and doesn't cover as much ground as before. Instead, you get to sidewalk. What's the difference? Pressing up or down makes you walk left or right from the fighter's perspective, which means you can't jump anymore. Only forward jumps are possible, not backwards or on the spot. Sure takes some getting used to, I'll tell you that much. Another new limitation is that you can't move backwards while crouching. This however shows up in the newer games. The physics are more realistic and grounded, canning the over-the-top approach of some of the earlier titles. The fourth entry is considerably slower than Tekken 3 and Tag, and combos have been toned down. It favors quick moves instead, but this seems very unbalanced, which is why the British boxer feels overpowered. Nowadays I can just look this stuff up, and maybe we could have done it at the time, I don't know, but even back then I felt that Gene was stronger than everyone else. I guess that's why he's on the cover. Tekken 4 brings back most of the modes from its predecessors, like Arcade, Time Attack, Versus Battle, Team Battle, Survival, Practice, Tekken Force and Theater. No Tekken Ball or Bowl sadly, but I guess that wouldn't have been such a great fit for reasons I'll explain soon enough. New is Training, which at first sounds like practice. That's correct-ish, but here's the new twist. This mode challenges you to perform 20 specific moves in under 3 minutes. That's a great way to learn some cool combos for every character. Too bad it became apparent just how terrible I am at this. I got confused sometimes when my fighter was on the right side of the screen and I had to flip the directional inputs that are displayed. At first I couldn't beat any of them and I was baffled as to why. With some practice I managed to squeak by, then I won more and more and started to appreciate this mode. Cool addition! Also new is story mode, which I've already touched on briefly. Yeah, the stories aren't covered in the arcade mode like they used to. That's why I personally never cared about arcade anymore and skipped right to story mode. In previous games, all you got was a mostly dialogue-less cinematic at the end. Here you get a bunch of backstory for most fighters. The text is narrated by this weird but distinct voice set to music that gets way too loud at the end. It's hard to hear what he's saying over the din. Thank god I can read. I'm mixed about it. On one side it gives us plenty of information, but on the other I'm not too hyped about the presentation. The images are fine and all that, don't get me wrong. The text speed is just a tad too slow for my taste. Back to the positive, I love how the song in the background slowly builds up and gets really dramatic at one point. In general, this mode consists of 8 battles. Often 7 of them are random and the final battle is against... Heihachi. Oh god. Who could have guessed? Many of them have a sort of sub-boss. For example, Marduk always fights King in stage 7 and vice versa, because it's relevant to their story. Yeah, they're almost coherent story. In some rare instances, it gets shaken up a bit. Kazuya and Jean are supposed to face off against each other in stage 7, but Daddy wins by default as Jean is missing. After stage 8, Heihachi takes Kazuya to a temple where he's captured Jean. It ends with a clash between father and son in stage 9. From Jean's perspective, he skips round 7 and the 
the fight against his father is stage 8. After defeating him, he gets to take revenge on his grandpa. As usual, one ending is canon and this time it's once again Heihachi who wins the tournament, capturing both his son and grandson. What a fucked up family. I'm not going to talk about every single story or we'll be here all day. But here are some of my highlights. Nina, Steve and Lei share a plot. Nina's supposed to take out Steve and Lei's trying to stop her. It sounds like gossip when I say it out loud. So you get to see this story from the perspective of each one of them, which is neat. Steve finds out that he was conceived through IVF and his biological mom is Nina of all people. Without her knowledge, I might add. Yeah, go figure. Horan gets to fight Jean after fighting Heihachi, but then they team up in the final cutscene where Jean speaks English. Unusual. So, what do you want? Violet only keeps up his disguise for the first seven fights. He and Lee have divergent beginnings, but the same ending. After defeating Heihachi, Lee presents Kamba to the world, but it malfunctions. That's why the robot is the true final boss for him. When you play as Kambot, it whoops Lee's ass in a cutscene instead. I believe this was the first time I completed story mode with every single character. Back then my dad pulled it off and unlocked the cinematics in theater mode. Therefore I didn't have to do it. I think it's a great mode that keeps me pretty glued to the mission and motivated to play it with all of them. The beat'em up mode Tekken Force returns and on paper it plays similarly to the third entry. If you remember my review from two years ago, you know I didn't exactly praise it to the heavens. I don't think I've ever triumphed over this edition and it's been almost 20 years since I last tried. Let's get right into it. Again there are four stages but this time it's not a Streets of Rage style side scroller. Instead it feels more like a third person brawler. Don't let that fool you into expecting something fresh. You fight hordes and hordes of goons, pick up chicken along the way and face a boss at the end. The chickens look absolutely ridiculous and don't fit at all to the otherwise serious tone. All these serious faces and they don't even crack a smile at the literal farm animals spinning around? I don't buy it. All this under a time limit but you gain precious seconds with every obliterated foe. New here is that you occasionally have to break obstacles. I guess otherwise it wouldn't be Tekken 4. Ah, that legendary game that has things in it. Objects and architecture and stuff. The first stage, military installation, is straightforward and simple. I picked Brian because he's strong and rather fast. Took me about 5 minutes to get to Combot and crumple his metallic ass. By the way, you get points at the end. Yay? Temple Ruins changes the setting, but ultimately it's the same shtick. This stage seems to go on and on and on, with a seemingly endless amount of douchebags to get rid of. After about 10 minutes, I beat the crap out of Panda. Corridor... Now that's where shit got nasty. Before you can blink, five guys gang up on you, but that's only the beginning. They're aggressive as fuck and kicked my ass to the continue screen within minutes. You get to continue? Thank god I don't have to play the first two stages again. But heart sweet mercy did I get sick of this stage. They attack in groups like a bunch of bullies. Then all of a sudden a few of them run away and won't fight you until you land a hit. What's that all about? Are we on the schoolyard? I want my lunch money back. I've got other games to buy. This stage goes on forever and everything looks the same. At certain points they come jumping at you out of nowhere and wipe out your energy. How would you know that the first time? It's so awkward to navigate with these weird controls. They don't fit this kind of gameplay. You can't move around freely but still have the same controls as if you were fighting just one opponent. I didn't seem to make any progress and after 40 minutes in this stage, I gave up. My hands started to hurt and I hated looking at these damn pillars. The genius that I am couldn't let it go so I tried again a few minutes later, this time with Eddie. I rushed through stages 1 and 2 like it was nothing. On stage 3 I failed once but then nailed it. Turns out Capoeira works much better than Brute Force. Took me about 15 minutes to get to Kazuya and show him his boss. What's up with these names by the way? Kazuya Fanatic? Get a hobby bro. The final level is called Mishima Fortress and as you would expect, it's a pain in the ass. On my third attempt I got really far but ultimately failed. Fourth time's the charm and I beat the crap out of Heihachi. Took me about 35 minutes. In total I spent two hours in a row on this mode, wrestling with my controller and the pain kept growing stronger by the minute. After that I didn't play video games for three days. My hands needed a break. 
break. I imagine this mode has its fans, but for me it was too tedious and monotonous. This is really difficult and ripe with bullshit moments. My main gripe is that it goes on for too long and fighting the same guys on loop gets old quickly, at least for me. I certainly won't play it again and it's no wonder I couldn't beat it back then. I think none of us did. Wait a minute, my brother has a high score. How the hell did he do that? He was just a kid. Now I feel like a jackass. Visually, this was a major leap from Tekken Tag. That game looked commendable for such an early PS2 game, but 4 steps it up in every single way. Animations are smoother and the facial expressions look way better. Overall, there's noticeably more detail on both the character models as well as the 12 stages. They're diverse and they all have their own flair. Jungle, for instance, adds water for a change, which looks absolutely stunning for its time. Quite disturbing when a defeated fighter lands in the water face down. Help them up maybe? Underground gives me Fight Club vibes with people cheering you on. The first rule of Underground, don't talk about Underground. Damn, I broke the rule. Laboratory has fog which adds mystery to this setting. What could be lurking in the mist? Some stages have up to three different versions. What they all have in common is that they're all realistic locations. Subsequent games would change that. This was the last time before things went zany. Two stages are unlockable. Statue is unlocked by beating story mode with Steve and Honmaru by beating Tekken 4s. Nothing easier than that. By the way, did you know that stage 7 in story mode is always either building or laboratory except for Steve? The more you know. As we're used to by this point, most fighters have two different costumes. Law rocks a mustache, which suits him I guess. Paul's iconic haircut is back, but for one of his costumes he lets his hair down like Kurt Cobain. All grunge and no guitar. King has even longer hair. Consider me a fan. Don't like either of Orong's haircuts. Liked it more in 3 and Tag. This is where Gene first wears his hoodie, which is awesome. I like that the hood blows off sometimes. The coolest dude on the block has to be Kazuya with his sunglasses. Looking smooth, man. Back then we used to make fun of Heihachi's bottom. I liked him better with pants on. Some characters have their last playable appearance. With heavy hearts, let's say goodbye to the ones who never return. <laughs> That's hardly anyone! One of the aspects that stands out the most to me is the audio. Punches and kicks still sound as satisfying as ever. Voice acting is kinda cheesy at times, unsurprisingly, and you get to hear many different languages. For the first time the fighters speak before every match. Time to die. Because of this game, my dad, my brother and I would keep saying random Japanese words without knowing what they meant. There aren't any subtitles. Koi, Ksamaka, Yamasurna, Ikkyo. The announcer speaks in a much calmer manner. You win. A stark contrast to the second game, I must say. You win. win. While I like my announcers with a little more energy, I'm of the opinion that it fits here. Especially with this soundtrack. The music is new terrain from everything that came before or after for that matter. Whereas Tekken 3 was going for an electro rock combo and Tekken Tag had a perfect use of electronic and techno, this game goes for a floatier atmospheric vibe matching the environmental focus. It's not your typical fighting game music, but it works. Fear is a great example for this. It's a beautiful track, but somehow it makes me feel uneasy. Maybe it's the way those big dense chords on the keyboard come out of nowhere. Lights on the other hand makes me feel like I'm drifting in the clouds. There are some more upbeat and catchy tracks like Bit Crusher, which has distorted vocals, organs and a jazzy bass line. Mob brings some leftover Tekken 3 guitar tricks to the table, but sounds more muffled. Jet has insane riffs which makes it a unique character select tune. I prefer the ones from the previous three console games, but that's a high bar I'm setting. Fans of the Tekken Tag soundtrack won't leave disappointed. Uninhabited has you covered if you like upbeat dance tracks. 
Each ending has its own tune as well, each fitting to what's going on on screen. There's lots of music to choose from, which is why it's hard to pick favorites. I managed to pick my champions, thus I present to you my top 5 songs from Tekken 4. Number 5. Another track that isn't your typical fighting game song. It too manages to stay in the background for the most part, but has a beautiful piano that makes it memorable. Imagine hearing this while standing on a skyscraper at night, looking at the horizon. Magical. Number 4. In a way the beach music represents this soundtrack wonderfully and I automatically think of Christy. It's upbeat without demanding much of your attention. The catchy and danceable samba beat, the piano and female voices that blend together in harmony. What more could you ask for? Number 3. This one's short, but I'm a sucker for pianos. It's straight up jazz and something I'd like to hear at a fancy dinner or something. Bring me some fettuccine Alfredo, paired with a light Merlot. Not that I often get a chance to have a fancy dinner accompanied by a jazz band, but whatever. An overlooked gem in my opinion that just screams Lee. Number 2. Ooh, that bass line. Compared to most songs on this soundtrack, it's rather dark and a perfect fit for the final battle. What do I feel when I hear it? Lots of things. It's ominous, even creepy, but it feels like a trance, a flow state. Maybe it's the drums and how relentless they seem. Anyway, you know a song is good when words don't do it justice. Number 1. This is the only track I've been listening to on a regular basis for years. It has a dreamy vibe and doesn't exactly get me pumped for a fist fight. I don't care because when I hear it my mood gets better instantly and it helps me relax. I listen to chill out a lot so this is exactly my jam. I wish this would play in real airports. Let's wrap this up, shall we? Tekken 4 is different. It looks different, it sounds different, it plays different, it feels, you guessed it, that same adjective. Whereas Tekken 3 was over the top in a positive way with ogres, beach balls, tiny dinosaurs, crazy floor humping doctors and much more, number 4 is more grounded in reality. Sure, you still have fighting panda bears and robots and a few silly endings. Most of the experience is rather serious and feels darker in comparison. I don't know how to feel about the whole thing. They tried something new and I like that. But maybe the contrast was too big, too wide of a stylistic golf. At the time I sure felt that way. Speaking of every game between Tekken 2 and 5, the ones I've played a lot, this is the one I tended to forget. I mentioned at the beginning it had been 14 years since I last touched it. It's easy to overlook compared to the others. Gameplay is fun and it was a delight returning to it after so many years. It took a while to get fluent with the new mechanics, especially the sidewalking and missing jumps. Quite frankly, I prefer fighting games without walls, but I do enjoy the strategic component that comes along with it. Although I'm glad they removed the elevation variation in later games. Once you get the hang of the setup, it makes sense. The character selection has drawn criticism over the years, but I honestly think it's fine if you compare it to 3 rather than tag. There are many different fighting styles to choose from and there should be something for everyone. As a teen, Christy was my favorite for more than obvious reasons. Today I'm more of a Nina fan. Oh, we're talking about gameplay? Well then Xiaoyu, Miharu, Violet and Lee are my favorites for sure. They are the ones I seem to excel at the most, at least by my standards. For the first time, Heihachi, Kazuya and Jean are all playable in the same main entry. Tension is rising to a boiling point. I like that during the victory poses some characters interact with the defeated fighter. <laughs> Calm down Brian, jeez! I played every mode and even beat story mode with everybody and never got bored. Tekken 4's being the one exception I couldn't stand. Difficulty in single player has been toned down, I think. 
On normal, it didn't get frustrating except for a handful of times. Heihachi is thankfully nothing compared to his Tekken 1 appearance. I will never get over that fiasco. In every entry, there seems to be one or two characters I usually have problems with. This time, my arch nemesis was Lei. I don't even know why, but he humiliated me more times than I'd like to admit. As I've said in my previous Tekken videos, I'm not that great at these games and I'm not very competitive. I just like to play them for fun, a lot of people can relate. At least I beat my dad's high score in survival mode. Fun little anecdote, I participated in a tiny local PS2 tournament in the mid 2000s. Of all the games that you could play, I only remember some Formula 1 game and of course Tekken 4. I managed to get into the finale, but lost. I don't remember who I was playing as, probably Xiao Yu, but oh boy do I remember the other players spamming the same move with King over and over again. I felt betrayed by the world. Compared to the previous two console games, I'm not as comfortable with the quote unquote limited moveset we have here. Maybe that would change if I played it even more, but honestly, I'd rather go back to the comfort of Tekken Tag instead. In my ranking of the games I've reviewed so far, I'm placing it slightly under Tekken 2, but it's a close call. If you have fond memories of this game and haven't played it in a while, then maybe you should give it another shot and relive those memories. In general, I do recommend it, but have to point out that this it's rather slow paced, especially compared to today's fighting games. The unique selling point for me is not the gameplay, but everything else around it. The atmospheric soundtrack, the serious tone and the weird feeling you get when you turn it on. No other game in the series feels like this and I doubt we'll ever see something like it again. I'm so glad I put this game back into my PS2. What a blast from the past. It's better than I ever gave it credit for, but doesn't stand out in a sea full of great Tekken games. Every once in a while it's a good idea to dig a little deeper to find gems like this. Hey everyone, this is G from. Thank you so much for watching episode 5 of season 4. Feel free to rate, comment, subscribe and follow me on social media. I'll see you later. Have a nice day.